ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Scott D. Anthony. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much, Norlin, and good morning, everyone. Very good. No one was put to sleep. That's a good sign as we start today. Uh, we are going to try not to bombard you with feedback from the microphone. Let's learn where I can stand and where I can. Not there. But we are going to try to make today as interactive as we can. So there are going to be exercises. There's going to be lots of time where you can come into the discussion and throw questions at me. I really would like to make this as much of a dialogue as we possibly can as we go through the day. Let me start by giving you one caveat as we get into the material for today, explain what my expectations are for what you should get out of today, and then I will start going through some of the materials to stimulate a discussion around this topic of innovation. I have a problem. My problem is the material we're going to talk about today is a borderline obsession of mine. I've been in this field of innovation for about 16 years now as a practitioner that has helped to grow a company, as an advisor that has worked with the leaders of many large companies, including some in the Philippines, as a venture capital investor that has invested in startup companies as a researcher, as a writer. This has been my obsession over the course of the past 16 years. The other problem I have is our organization is weird. Our organization is a US-based organization of about 100 people that I ostensibly run from my base in Singapore, where I have lived since 2010. Because most of our people are in the United States, but I'm based in Singapore, it means two things. Number one, I have a lot of late night phone calls. And number two, I'm on an awful lot of airplanes. The field of consulting demands that you travel. When your people are in the US, there's a lot of long trips that I take. I'm a bit of a nerd. I track all of this stuff. In an average year since 2010, I travel 293,000 miles in the air. It means my average height for the year is about 1,000 feet off the ground, which is sad. The good news is it gives me a lot of time to think and write, which is why I've written some of those books you saw before. The bad news in all of this is I know way too much about this field. There are too many things that we could possibly talk about in the course of a single day. So I try as best I can to filter and choose and pick out the concepts that will be most resonant for the audience, but it also means that it will be a little bit like a fire hose. And I expect by the end of the day, some of you will be knocked backwards and staggering, saying, oh, I don't know what to do with all of this. I expect as we go through the activities today, which are intended to whet your appetite around innovation, all of you will say, not enough time to do everything that I could do. This is by design. What I'm intending you to get at the end of the day today is no more than three things. Number one, I want to give you a very simple language system around innovation. A lot of the struggles that we see people have with innovation simply come because they make the field more complex than it needs to be. So I'm going to give you some very simple definitions to help give you a way to talk about innovation inside your organization. Number two, I will give you some very simple tools. Some of these you'll have a chance to practice with. Others will just give you a first exposure to. But you will have things that you can bring back and begin to use tomorrow to advance innovation in your organization. Third, and by far most critically, I want you to leave today with a feeling. Two days from now, you won't remember what was on slide 62. You won't remember the third line in the second quiz I had you do during an activity. But I want you to have a sense that rather than being something shrouded in mystery, rather than being a black art, rather than being something that requires special DNA, innovation is a field that any of you can master and manage with careful practice because that feeling will lead to all of you going and studying more and practicing more. So those are the three things that I will commit to deliver by the end of the day today. A language, some tools, and a feeling. 
I'll tell you some stories. I'll show you some pictures. You'll understand why there's a shark drinking a milkshake, flying a kite, a man in a wizard hat, a butterfly, and self-promotionally a cover of my book by the end of the day today. So with that, let me turn on my clicker and get started. So the way we have organized my content modules, and thank you for fixing the feedback. I can wander more. I wander. I have a Fitbit. I track my steps. I know when I speak, I get high step counts because I can't stand still. Anyway, so I, we have four content modules that I will go through. In each module, I will aspire to give you the core thinking behind the module in about 25 minutes or so. This is not pre-packaged material. This is the first time I've ever presented this exact flow to an audience. So it might be plus or minus a few minutes. We'll then give you a chance at your tables to use some pretty simple do-it-yourself guides to practice the concept. We use the word workshop, but we know you won't fully complete any of these things, just a way to reinforce. Then we'll have some questions and then move on to the next topic. I wanted to start with a, a pretty simple one. How do you fundamentally change the soul of your company? That's not simple, obviously. That's incredibly complex. But this is what I wanted to do to frame the beginning of the day. For each module, there'll be three key messages I will be driving home. Here they are for this one. Number one, disruption is coming to every nook and cranny of the global economy. Number two, in response to that, you have to remember three letters, A, B, C. And number three, to get started following these three letters, you need to demonstrate the courage to choose. Let's dive in. Let me tell you about three face-to-face -face encounters that I had with disruptive change to begin to frame up this conversation. This is the first time I ever met a disruptive innovator. That is me in the hands of my grandfather, Robert N. Anthony Sr. I'll tell you his story at the beginning of the next module. I would later learn in life that the year I was born, 1975, was also the year when a disruptive technology was born. The disruptive technology was created by this guy here, Steve Sasson. Steve Sasson at the time was an engineer that came up with a new technology. Here is the technology he created. Anyone know what Steve Sasson is holding there? This is a prototype he created in 1975. What is this? Digital camera. So this is the world's first digital camera prototyped in 1975. There he is in 1975, 24 years old, kind of long hair, looks a bit like a, a hippie, whatever you want to call it. Do you know where he worked in 1975? Kodak, that is correct. So imagine this scene. It's 1975. At the moment, Kodak is at its height, one of the world's most powerful companies. 80% market share, 70% margins in its core business, selling film. This young engineer comes up with a camera that has no film. How does Kodak feel about that? Sasson told the New York Times, management's response is, that's cute, please don't tell anybody about it. That's not entirely fair because Kodak actually invested heavily in digital imaging. But we know how this story ended. The world's first commercial digital camera was introduced in 1990. The world didn't end overnight for Kodak, but it did indeed end by 2012. A couple ups, a couple downs, Kodak had gone bankrupt. From the introduction commercially of the disruptive technology, cameras without film, to the demise of the incumbent, it took about 20 years. Let me now fast forward a little bit. This first story was 1975. The second story will go to 1994. This was my first face-to-face -face encounter as a practitioner with a disruptive technology. At the time, in 1994, I was the managing editor of a daily newspaper. Now, you will see the picture here, and you will pretty quickly realize this is not the New York Times, USA Today, or any major newspaper. No, this was my college newspaper. If you saw in my biography at the beginning, I went to a small school in the United States called Dartmouth College. This is located in Hanover, New Hampshire. Anyone here ever been to Hanover, New Hampshire before, by any chance? It's a beautiful place to visit, particularly this time of year. The leaves are changing on the trees. Very, very pretty place. It's in the middle of nowhere. The closest US city is Boston, about a two-hour drive away. 
Hanover has a population of about 10,000 people and nothing happens there. Yet still, somehow, I and my colleagues managed to put out a newspaper five days a week. We covered hot happenings like moose loose in the college cafeteria, which actually happened while I was at Dartmouth. Or this one, town considers adding a second stoplight, which they did. It was a huge deal. We took it seriously. We had a staff of 50. We had about $250,000 worth of revenues. Now, 1994 was an interesting year in the media world. This movie came out. Anyone recognize this? Shawshank Redemption. So this is my tip for about, I don't know, 517 today. When you see this picture again, the presentation materials are done. It'll all make sense when we get to the end. This is my very last slide here. 1994 was interesting for other reasons. In December of that year, Mark Andreessen and his team introduced this the Netscape browser. For the first time, people could access the World Wide Web. There we were, a leadership team confronted with a disruptive technology. Like leadership teams all around the world, we had to decide what do you do in the face of that disruption? What did we do? Our first reaction when we saw the internet wasn't excitement, it was terror. We did nothing. We were worried about how this would affect our core business. That $250,000 in revenue I mentioned primarily came from charging people money to subscribe to the newspaper. We had no idea, and people today still haven't figured out, how to charge for content online. So our first feeling wasn't hope or excitement, it was terror. We paused. We got over that fear. After all, we were college students. We didn't have a board of directors or shareholders to worry about. We could do whatever we wanted. But we didn't reimagine, reconfigure, or reinvent our business. When we went online, we did what almost every major media organization did, which was create a word-for-word, pixel-for-pixel replication of the print version of the newspaper online. Rather than thinking, what could we do differently, we tried to force-fit the technology through the lens of our business model. I would later learn when I went to the Harvard Business School and studied with Dr. Clay Christensen, who coined the idea of disruptive innovation, that these two challenges, failing to allocate resources to the change, failing to reimagine the business in the face of the change, is what has historically made it so hard for market leaders to respond to disruption. How did this work out for us and the rest of the industry? Not very well. This is one of the more stunning charts you will see about the impact of disruptive change. Note again, the world didn't end overnight. My story began in 1994. The next 12 years or so were actually pretty good for the US newspaper industry. Then you get to about 2006, 2007, and 55 years of growth are eviscerated in five short years. 12 years, in this case, from about beginning to end. Let me tell you my third and final story in this first subpart of our first module. Let's go to 2007. 2007 was a year of disruptive births. Here was an important one for my family. This is my second child, my daughter, Holly. You will meet all four of my children by the end of the presentation today at various parts of the discussion. There's Holly. She was born in December 2007, continues to be a very disruptive force in the Anthony household, though we love her dearly. The mobile phone industry suffered a very disruptive birth in 2007 as well. In January of that year, Steve Jobs announced. In June of that year, Steve Jobs launched the iPhone. Show of hands, how many of you have an iPhone today? I will judge that to be about 35% of the room. Also in 2007, Google and a number of handset manufacturers got together behind the Android operating system, launched the Open Handset Alliance. How many of you have an Android phone? Hopefully one that doesn't spontaneously catch on fire. It looks like about 50% of the room. In 2007, neither of these companies were leaders in the mobile phone industry. There was an unquestionable king in that industry. Who was it? Nokia. How many of you have a Nokia phone today? There's one in every crowd. We're, we're at an innovation discussion, sir. You shouldn't have Nokia phones anymore. 
So Nokia was the unquestioned market leader. I'll come back to them in just a second. We know that Nokia is no longer the king. Here's what happened in that industry again. The world doesn't change overnight. Apple began to grow, and Nokia's business still looked pretty good, peaking three years after the launch of the iPhone at about 100 million handsets sold a year. 2015, Microsoft takes a write-off on that transaction, a price of about $5 billion, saying that what they had purchased was essentially worthless. The king dies, and in this case, rather than taking 12 years, it takes about six years. You notice the pattern here. The time frame that goes from the inception and launch of the disruptive change is shrinking. 20 years to 12 years to six years. More broadly, we see the pace of change accelerating and going into more places than it ever did before. One piece of long-term research that we have done looks at the lifespan of companies on the S&P 500, the largest, most powerful publicly traded companies in US markets. You notice this goes through cycles, but the trend line is going down. It was in the 30s and the 60s. It's now in the teens here. Our research suggests that 50%, 5-0% of the companies on the S&P 500 will not be on that index 10 short years from now. What will happen to them? Well, some might be like US Steel here. It still exists, but it's no longer as important as it used to be. Some will be, like, it will be like Avon, that will be acquired by another company. Some will be like Kodak or Radio Shack, going out of business. Who will replace them? It might be a company like Accenture that's existed for a long period of time, but takes the next wave of growth. Or even more likely, it will be companies like Facebook. Facebook is 12 years old and one of the 12 most valuable companies in the world. The great companies of tomorrow are companies that likely do not even exist today. So this is the first key message I want you to remember from today. If you watch the show Game of Thrones or you read the books on which it's based, you know the Stark family has a saying, winter is coming. It is not winter that is coming. Global warming is taking care of that. Instead, it is disruption that is coming to every nook and cranny of the global economy. There are no longer safe industries. Every industry has to confront the existential challenge of disruptive change. Now, we were founded by the guy who coined the term disruptive innovation. It's another one of our obsessions. We think about it all the time. There are some meta disruptions that we're watching very closely. The rise of robots and drones. Amazon and Alibaba are both experimenting with ways to do drone-based delivery. Amazon is an incredibly inventive company. It filed a patent recently for what's known as predictive delivery. That is, they start to deliver something to you before you even order it. Now, they're not reading your mind yet. Instead, they're using big data analytics to predict where packages will go in particular areas. They start to ship them, and then they write the specific label and direct the drones as the package is mid-delivery. Amazing stuff. We're looking at 3D printing, additive manufacturing. The woman pictured here graduated from the Harvard Business School and created a company called Mink. Her 3D printer custom creates makeup, any color or hue that you want, created in your own home. Now, whether or not this succeeds, who knows, but the ability to custom create things at very low scale, when combined together with different ways to distribute things, will change fundamentally the businesses of anyone who is involved in making stuff, in distributing stuff, in shipping stuff, and in selling stuff. These worlds will also change as computing continues to disappear. Smart connected devices, the Internet of Things. This is an early application from Disney, which allows Disney, this is the, the magic band that you get in some of its theme parks. The Magic Band allows Disney to do an even better job of executing one of the world's truly most brilliant business models. When you go into a Disney theme park, Disney picks you up by your ankles, they turn you upside down, they shake every dollar and cent out of your pocket, they stand you back up, and have you leave with a great big smile on your face. Now done even better with the Magic Band. 
You also, as you have computing disappearing, you are now beginning to have the rise of the quantified self, the science of life, whatever you want to call it. I mentioned I religiously wear this Fitbit. It allows me every day to see how many steps I took, how well I slept, etc. You can see here a pretty good walking day, not such a good sleep day, probably because I was worried about the fifth big trend, everything as a service. You probably have heard the line, the world's biggest taxi company, Uber, owns no taxis. The world's biggest hotel company, Airbnb, owns no hotels. Everything is being turned into a service. Yes, if you want to rent a nerd for an hour, you can do that. Whatever you want to do with them is up to you. Even our business, management consulting, is in the process of getting disrupted. What do you do in the face of all of this? Disruption is coming. You've got big changes coming. They're happening faster than they ever did before. The answer is both simple and complex. It is fundamentally not to incrementally improve what you're doing, but to fundamentally transform it, to go proverbially from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Now, oftentimes when people use the word transformation, they mean something a little different than what we intend. It might be something like this. Kylie Jenner undergoes dramatic transformation as she ditches dark hair for blonde locks. I'm sure that was a really big deal for Kylie and the rest of the family, but when we think about transformation in a business context, we mean something fundamentally different. Let me tell you the story of this guy here, Clark Gilbert, who I am sure has never met any member of the Jenner or Kardashian family. Clark is somebody who I first met in the year 2000. At the time, he was a professor at the Harvard Business School studying how incumbents respond to disruptive change. He focused his study on the US newspaper business that was undergoing the change I talked about before. He wrote his award-winning doctoral thesis describing what newspaper companies have to do. He's been an advisor to our company since its foundation, so he and I consulted to many US newspaper companies, all of whom ignored what we told them. So all this happens, the industry goes through lots of trouble. Clark, in 2008, gets tapped on the shoulder and is asked to be the CEO of a newspaper company. The industry laughs. They say, ah, the academic will learn what it's like to actually be in the field and practice. Clark leaves that organization, it's called the Deseret News in the state of Utah in the United States, in 2015. And that company has fundamentally changed. The company was in free fall, but from 2008 to 2015, net income increased by about 40%. Goes down a little bit, but then surges up. The way Clark did this taught us a pattern that we see for companies that successfully confront the challenge of disruptive change. Clark did not one thing, but two things. First, he took his historical newspaper product and fundamentally repositioned it. If you go back to when he took the job in 2008 and you looked at his newspaper, it looked like any other newspaper in America. There were sports scores and movie reviews, etc. Clark said people can get that basic stuff from the internet much better than we could ever do it. So what we are going to do is focus, focus, focus on what we can uniquely do. His newspaper is affiliated to the church with which he is affiliated, the Mormon Church. So he decided to position the print newspaper on issues of faith and family, which matter not just to people in the Mormon church, but to many other people as well. Today, that newspaper is the fastest growing print publication in the United States. So the core business still exists, but it's been repositioned in a narrower problem to be solved. He then, in parallel to this, went and created a completely different growth business. This is what he calls digital marketplaces, where you bring together consumers and then find ways to target advertisement to them. For example, the largest connection of social media sites connected to mothers are owned by Deseret Digital, a separate organization that Clark set up to go and create these businesses. If you want to find out, is a movie okay for my eight-year-old girl to watch, you can go to one of their collection of market spaces to learn about this. There are some connections between the two businesses. This wasn't unrelated diversification. 
They share common brand, they share some content, they share parts of the advertising field for us, but they are two very distinct efforts that Clark has done, fundamentally changing his organization. This is what we call dual transformation. You have to remember three letters to get this right, A, B, C. First, the A. This is transformation A, where you're repositioning today's business. In Clark's case, that was going from commodity coverage in his newspaper to a focus on faith and family. In the case of Netflix, founded in 1995 by Reed Hastings, they have done three different transformation A's in their history. The first version of Netflix allowed you to rent a DVD and get it delivered to you at home. When you wanted to return that DVD, you sent it back. If you took too long holding it, you paid late fees. In 1998, Netflix shifted its models from individual movie renting to a subscription model where you could have as many movies as you wanted. In 2007, they changed the model again. How many of you are Netflix subscribers today? Are you getting DVDs through the mail? That would be quite a feat coming from the US to the Philippines, of course. They go from sending things through the mail to streaming, allowing them to go from one country to 200 countries in a very short period of time. Then in 2011, they do their third transformation A. Historically, Netflix packaged other people's content, starting with House of Cards and moving to a number of other shows. They began producing their own content. They're still doing the same fundamental thing for you as a consumer. You're getting entertainment, but the way in which they have done that, the core business model they're following, has changed in a very substantial way. That's the A part of the equation. Transformation B. This is not repositioning today. This is creating tomorrow. This is Clark Gilbert creating his digital market spaces. Or this is what Amazon did about a decade ago. Ten years ago, Amazon had an internal challenge. IT projects were taking too long. An internal team was commissioned. They figured out a way to modularize systems so they could dramatically accelerate it. The project manager working on this told Jeff Bezos, Amazon's founder and CEO, I think we could actually turn this into a commercial business. Ultimately launched what now is known as Amazon Web Services. A completely different business. This isn't a traditional retail business. This is now the world's largest provider of cloud computing solutions, a highly profitable, rapidly growing business that has pushed Amazon in completely different directions. This is the B part of the equation, finding a new problem to solve that allows you to push your business in new directions. The C. I told you that what Clark did was not unrelated diversification. Rather, there is a very carefully managed capabilities link between the historical business and tomorrow's business that takes what used to be known as the innovator's dilemma and turns it into the innovator's opportunity. The thing that's pictured here is a new business that Medtronic, the world's largest medical device manufacturer, launched in India a few years ago. The business is called Healthy Heart for All. What this is, is a new business model that allows Medtronic to bring its pacemaking technology to many more people in India. India has more heart disease than any country in the world, but Medtronic struggled to bring its pacemaker to people who needed it because they couldn't afford the pacemaker. By doing direct-to-consumer advertising like this to raise awareness, by launching diagnostic camps to try and find people who needed a pacemaker, and then most critically, to creating the world's first loan program for an implantable medical device. Think about that for a second. We've got some people from banks here. You give out a loan to somebody who buys a hard good like a car, and they don't pay it back? No problem. You repossess the asset. You give someone a loan for a device that gets implanted in their chest, and they don't pay it back? That's a little bit more challenging. But drafting on principles of community, of social finance, of peer-to-peer -peer lending, et cetera, microfinance, Medtronic was able to solve this problem. What's cool about this story is Medtronic did something that literally two companies in the world could do. Rather than have size be a disadvantage, 
They took advantage of their unique assets, the ability to operate in a regulated field, their knowledge of the healthcare industry, access to doctors, and they turned that into a huge growth opportunity. There it is, the dual transformation framework. Transformation A, reposition today. Transformation B, create tomorrow. And C, the capabilities link that ties the two of them together. This is something that we've seen a number of companies do around the world. If you look at Adobe, their transformation A has been software as a service where you don't buy packaged software anymore. Transformation B has been marketing analytics. Apple has done this, I think, quite clearly. Over in the healthcare space, Janssen, which is the drug arm of Johnson & Johnson, has changed the way that it creates drugs by working with third parties. And even more radically, is imagining a world where nobody gets disease. They intercept disease before you get it, which is a really radical idea for a company that sells pharmaceuticals to manage disease. And then over in Singapore, Singtel, the largest telecommunications operator in Southeast Asia, its A is moving from voice to data, its B is moving into new spaces like mobile advertising and cybersecurity. Final thing I want to talk about in this module before I give you a few minutes to practice with these concepts is how you have the courage to choose. Clark Gilbert, I mentioned before, calls this the hardest problem in business today. And he is right. Because the time when it becomes clear that you need to do this is often the moment when it is too late to do anything about it. Let's go back to one of those cases I talked about before, Nokia. How did the world look to Nokia in 2007 when Apple launched the iPhone? It looked pretty good. November of that year, Forbes ran this cover story. One billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? It had three times the market share of anybody else in that business. Now, there's one company I didn't mention about whether you had a phone or not from them. We talked about Nokia. We talked about Apple. We talked about Android. Who else is an important player in the industry historically that just announced it was getting out? Motorola we've got here. BlackBerry. So BlackBerry, also somebody that wasn't quite big enough to make the list, but its stock price, like Nokia's, was surging during 2007. Had a lock hold over the enterprise. Everything looked good. How does it feel when you're a leader, when some of these disruptions begin? Let me play a short video clip that is sh shot in April of 2008, after all of this began, with the co-CEO of BlackBerry, to give you a real view of how this feels in the early days. Hey, everybody. Say hello to Mr. Jim Balsillie. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thank you to be here. Okay, we'll do it. That's a great. Wow. How is it that you have the same one that I have? Shouldn't you uh, have some fancy James Bond version? You're living the dream, man. <laughs> doesn't even have a camera. You don't have the camera one. How are things going? Things are really good, thanks. Yeah, yeah. excellent. excellent. As you imagine, um, I mean, all the things that have sort of changed in your life in the last 10 or 15 years? Uh, a lot less has changed than you would think, really. A very normal life, kind of. It, it, it's just a whole lot more zeros on everything. Yeah. So. Which is great if the decimal point's in the right place. You know? uh, the, the, I mean, where, where Rim has gone uh, in the last, like, you know, did you have a moment where you thought, okay, I think we, we've reached, like, we're here? You know, not a lot, really. I don't, I don't sort of think that way. I don't, I don't sort of look up too much. I don't look down too much. Uh, you know, I just, it's the great fun is doing what you do every day. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, not, I'm sort of a poster child for not sort of, doing anything but what we do, uh, you know, every day. So, um, no, I don't really think about it a lot, no. I mean, do you get the sense that at, at this point with what the BlackBerry itself, that device has done for your company, that it's a matter of time before other people, like the iPhone didn't really do it. I mean, like, do you ever look at it and go, what are we going to do if this isn't our primary business, growing rim beyond something like a BlackBerry? Mm -hmm. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly die. <laughs> so that'll just be yeah, it. We're a very poorly diversified portfolio. <laughs> it's like, it's on one thing. It either goes to the moon or it crashes dirt. So, uh, <laughs> but it's making it to the moon pretty good. So sure, totally. We'll stay with it. Either goes to the moon or crashes to earth. BlackBerry stock now research in motion down 97% since this video aired. Stephen Elop became the CEO of Microsoft in late 2010. He looks around at what's going on and writes what became known as the burning platform memo given as a speech to Nokia. 
describes the famous story of someone who was on literally a burning platform and what they chose to do. If you wait until the platform is on fire, you have two choices. One is you jump and pray. The other is that you get burnt to a crisp. These are not good strategic options. Instead, what you need to do is to have the courage to choose to begin to change your enterprise, your business unit, your business line, your product, before the platform is on fire. In contrast to Stephen Elop, we show Mark Bertolini. Mark Bertolini is the CEO of a large health insurance company called Aetna. He gets the position in 2010. Everything looks great. The Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, has been passed. 50 million customers are now in play. Aetna has record earnings and record profits. In the face of all of this, Bertolini decides to blow the business up because he says, in the long run, this needs to be done, so I want to get out ahead of it. The question all of you have as leaders, and this is the last bit of content before I give you a chance to practice, then we get some questions as a group. The question for all of you as leaders is, how do I know? How can I sense that a big change is coming before I'm standing on that burning platform? We have six things that we look for, early warning signs of disruptive change. First, you begin to see some decreases in customer loyalty, often driven by the fact that you are over-serving or overshooting your customers. In layman's terms, that means you are giving them bells and whistles and features that matter to you, that matter to your engineers, but don't matter to them. I think of this whenever I pick up a remote control inside my hotel room. Somewhere in the world for the TV, somewhere in the room, in the world, there is an engineer who thought that 53rd button was really going to make the difference. But I can't figure out how to use it and I don't care about it. When you begin to offer people the 53rd button, they'll take it, but they won't pay for it which creates opportunities for someone to come in and satisfy them with a simple, easy solution. Venture capitalists investing in a space is an early warning sign. Not everything will pan out, but all the investments today going into things like artificial intelligence, 10 or 20 years from now, undoubtedly will cause big change. You then begin to see a catalytic event. This could be an entrant emerging. Often it's not straight in the mainstream of your market. Often it's at the fringes. The first iPhone wasn't a good phone. The battery life wasn't good. The call quality wasn't good. But there was a population of users that loved it because it gave them something that they otherwise couldn't get. When you look down your nose at something that's beginning to get traction, watch out. Watch even more when habits begin showing signs of changing because that's often the trigger point that suggests disruption is coming. You then get to the point where you feel the impact. Somebody goes from just the technology to a business model that's really hard to beat. In the case of Apple, you add on the App Store, you change the way that you distribute the product, and the market leaders are in real trouble. And finally, you feel it on your financial statements. Ironically, in the beginning days, it actually feels pretty good is you're often losing the lowest margin tier of your business, and you're working the cost side of your business to push profit margins up. So it looks okay, but that's a clear sign that you face a true existential threat. You've got in the materials, I believe, I hope, if you have your little packets in front of you, you have your little packets in front of you, I'm gonna do a little bit of mind control here, you should have some white pieces of paper in there, that are activity guides and summary sheets. The first activity guide has a version of this chart here, which shows a very simple set of things that we look for to try to assess the possibility of, or the early warning signs of disruptive change. What this does is take the six factors that I talked about and gives you a quick way to assess, are we safe? Are we seeing some signs of danger? Or are we in the red alert phase of this particular area? What I would like you to do at your table for maybe the next 10 minutes or so is to take that early warning sign assessment and very quickly look at the lens of whatever is most appropriate for you and your colleagues. If you're with a team, talk about it together. If you're by yourself, you might do it yourself and trade with the person sitting next to you. But try and assess for your business, a business unit, whatever you want to analyze, how well you conform to these criteria. 
then once you've done that, start talking about these questions. How worried should we be? Do I want to change jobs with the person sitting next to me? Are we responding appropriately? And what might we do to respond? As one quick example of this, my colleague Clayton Christensen, when he presents, he ends his presentation by saying, I will pray for your organization if you pray for the Harvard Business School. Because he believes the Harvard Business School is in the process of being disrupted. And as you look at some of the things here, as you look at the number of GMAT test takers decreasing, as you look at all the venture investment in massive online open courses and other things, as you look at new players coming into the market offering free solutions online, as you look at people getting education in new ways, you see very clear signs that Harvard needs to be worried. Now, it's still doing pretty well financially. Last time I checked, its endowment is about the size of the GDP of the Philippines. So it doesn't have reason to worry tomorrow. But through this lens, you can begin to see why even the venerable Harvard Business School and its two-year MBA program needs to worry about this. So again, let's take about 10 minutes working at our tables. Then I'll take some questions and feedback from the audience. If you have any questions as you're going through things, I'll be here. Just raise your hand or throw something at me, and I'll do my best to help. So about 10 minutes before we open it up to questions. Thank you.